Welcome to today's webinar. The Itch You Cannot Scratch Veterinary Dermatology is presented by Dr. Erica Wasak, Senior Clinical Pharmacist at the Animal Health Center, College of Veterinary Medicine at Mississippi State University. Erica's pharmacy career combines her passion for pharmacy and love for animals. Her areas of interest include clinical pharmacology, veterinary compounding, research, drug information, and education. Erica precepts pharmacy students at the University of Mississippi, Union University, and the University of Tennessee, as well as veterinary students and technicians at Mississippi State. She also serves as the president of the American College of Veterinary Pharmacists. Today's webinar is accredited through ACPE and is worth one contact hour. CE credit is applied following completion of an evaluation link found on the last slide in the presentation handout. You can find the handout on the lower portion of the GoToWebinar toolbox under handouts. We are recording this session and will include the recording and evaluation link in a follow-up email. Questions may be submitted throughout the webinar using the GoToWebinar toolbox on the right side of your screen under the Questions tab. We will answer the questions submitted following the presentation. If we do not get to your question today, a list of questions and answers will be emailed to all attendees following the webinar. Thank you for joining today's session. Well, thank you so much for our wonderful introduction, Amy, and good afternoon to everyone who's on Central Time, and happy hump day to every single person. Hopefully you're having a good week so far. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to come listen to me talk about veterinary dermatology is one of one of my favorite subjects I have out there in veterinary pharmacology. Um, so hopefully you enjoy a little bit and learn about the itch you cannot scratch veterinary dermatology. So let's get started. As far as disclosures, I have no conflict of interest or anything apparent to let you guys know about. However, the one thing in veterinary medicine, we do a lot of off-label of medications in our veterinary species. Um, so if you see me talk about something, it may not be FDA approved in that particular species and is off-label. As far as continuing education credit goes, um, you guys are approved for one CE um, credit hour, so thank you guys so much for this. And so let's get started. So hopefully by the end of this hour, for those that are listening in, um, I'm hoping to review some common dermatologic conditions that are affecting canines. Um, I will be discussing pharmacological management of atopic dermatitis, which is one of our major dermatological issues that we see in dogs. And then the last thing I want to be talking about is um, examining the antimicrobial therapy options with canine pyoderma. And that's also something that's very common that we see in the dermatology basis. So let's get started on the most common dermatological conditions that we see um, in my hospital at Mississippi State. We have a wonderful dermatologist. She's just absolutely fabulous at what she does. And so these are probably the most common things that she is presented when a patient comes into um, her clinic. So the first one I'm going to talk about is pruritus. Um, this is probably the number one symptom that she addresses when a patient comes in. And it's probably the biggest complaint that a client has when that patient comes to see our dermatologist. Um, I'll be going over pyoderma, what that is. We'll go into the treatment options. Autoimmune diseases, we have one particular autoimmune that's the most common derm condition out there in dogs. And then the big gun is the atopic dermatitis. And that's probably where I'm gonna spend the most time um, for this hour is talking about that. So I will tell you, there's a whole lot more dermatological issues involved in veterinary medicine. Um, we have ear problems, we have ear infections, we have so many other different types of skin problems that we see in veterinary medicine. However, I feel like these are the top four um, that is probably I see when I'm at Mississippi State. So the first one is pruritus, which is itching. Um, this is basically, I mean, everyone is, is always get itchy, even humans. And so it's the unpleasant sensation on the skin that provokes the desire to scratch. And this is literally the most common complaint owners have with their pets is my dog will no, would not stop scratching. It will not lick this area. It will keep on going on and on and on to the point where you see some problems and that's when the dermatologist gets involved. 
As far as itching goes, it can be sharp. It can be localized in one little location where we see hot spots, things like that from that licking in that particular area. And then sometimes it's a diffuse burning sensation where the dog can kind of scratch all over, not get one particular site. Um, but basically it's all over scratchy, itchy, and it's just all of a sudden, all the time, like trying to get these areas um, that they feel as being um, that concern. The biggest thing about itching is not exactly a disease state in its own standpoint. So there's a lot of causes of itching. And the biggest one that we see a lot of is parasites. And so fleas and ticks, mites, all of those different parasites that are on the skin is what causes that itching of that dog and scratching, mostly because it's annoying, it's it's biased, it's irritating, and so they want to make sure that they get to that area and try and flick that parasite off. And so that's why it's really important that as pharmacists and veterinarians, we try to tell owners that their babies need to be on a preventative, some type of flea and tick preventative, because um, this can actually prevent not only infestation or other problems, but the itching that is involved with those parasites. Um, we have infections, so sometimes certain skin infections and things that are happening in that area can actually cause an itching sensation. We'll we can talk about that a little bit with pyoderma. Allergies, this is probably the big one. Allergies is probably one of the most common um, causes of itching in a dog. So that's probably the biggest thing that our dermatologist kind of looks into is what that cause is. And then we also have a lot of cancer that's involved in the skin, um, cutaneous neoplasia, certain things. Um, most of the time it's benign, but that little area right there can actually be very irritating and them wanting to um, scratch that particular area. So even though this is a common condition, this is probably the number one thing, again, that a veterinarian kind of has to figure out what's the problem? Why is this dog itching and scratching this certain area? So when we're thinking about our patients, usually, um, at least for my dog, she's always looking a certain area. If it's uh, very irritating, she'll scratch it. Sometimes they like to suck it or bite that area. You can kind of see a little nibble of that little spot. Um, they'll chew that area, so it can actually can cause a lot of infections. They might want to rub or roll the area. So sometimes if you, if you see your dog, my dog just did it this morning, um, she just tried to roll in a field and um, try to get that little area because she's she was very itchy in the back of her, um, her back. So it was one of those things that they may roll and rub and try to make sure they rub against a certain furniture or certain things in the house. The one of the we talked about parasites being the most common cause of pruritus, and that's where Demodex is involved. And so what Demodex is, is an obligatory parasite in dogs, it's a mite. And this Demodex is probably you see this in this picture that I have on the slide for you guys. This is a very severe case of a Demodex mange that is happening for this patient. Um, and so what it is with demodex what causes this is is usually a result of some underlying immunodeficiency with that particular animal it could be one they're a puppy and as a puppy the immune system is just not where at that level it needs to be yet um, sometimes if they have a certain type of disease state like an autoimmune disease or a immunosuppression medication or anything like that that can actually increase that risk of a demodex problem if those patients um, when we talk about demodex Usually if it's a localized demodex in, um, infection and scratching is in that little hot spot, if it's localized, it'll usually self-resolve over time. Um, but if you see a generalized, like we do for this picture of this patient, um, this will generally require treatment of that particular patient. Usually it's some type of antibiotic, um, trying to get something off and getting that mite cleaning, shampooing, um, trying to make sure that that mange um, and that itching and that sensation will go away. So when we think about itching, um, the biggest goal is to discover the source of that itching and treating that cause. And so we'll talk about some other causes of itching a little bit later, um, but that is the most common thing our veterinarian sees. Pyoderma is also uh, a really common 
condition that our veterinarians see. Um, the most common form of pyoderma is superficial bacterial folliculitis or SBF. You might hear me refer that to, um, but pyoderma, that folliculitis infection, that is the most common superficial infection that you see on the skin. Um, this is also one that is secondary to an underlying disease state. So you'll see allergies as a common theme throughout this presentation. Um, we have irritants. So if, when I say an irritant, it could be they got into something that they shouldn't have. Um, they were rubbing in something like oil or something along those lines that, that can't come off and is irritating to that skin. It could be certain things that we have in the household, like cleaners or things like that, that can be very irritating and can lead to that infection. Parasites, that's probably another big one of why we need to be on preventatives for our patients. Um, parasites are probably another reason why it's that scratching, that licking of that area constantly with those fleas can actually result in pyoderma. And so it's really important to treat and maintain and prevent those parasites from happening um, for our patients. And then we also have um, seborrhea. And seborrhea is just basically excessive flaking dry skin that happens. And so over time, like with that dry skin, it can be very irritating. It can actually cause infections. Um, my cat has this condition. Um, and so for us, we're constantly having to make sure they're groomed um, very well when we are looking into um, preventing that from happening. So this is a chronic condition or a recurrent condition if that underlying disease is not controlled. So our main goal is to, one, we gotta treat the infection, um, but two, we gotta figure out what's causing that infection. Is it an allergy? So we gotta go into figure out what that allergy is and kind of help with that medicine and that treatment for it. Is it a parasite? Well, let's get rid of that parasite. Let's get um, get a preventative on board and prevent that infection from happening. Grooming, you know, things like that. If it's seborrhea, trying to make sure it's a healthy skin. So those are things that we're looking at on preventing skin infections from happening. And we'll talk about when we actually have to treat that skin infection a little bit later when we talk about treatment options. Um, but most signs and symptoms when a patient comes see our dermatologist, um, you'll see papules and crust. They'll have alopecia, so hair loss and um, fur loss around certain areas of the body. They can be erythema or even hyper or hypopigmentation. Um, so that all happens um, with pyoderma. So, and I apologize for the graphicness of this um, picture right here, um, but you can see that this is a kind of a, a little bit of a more severe case of pyoderma, um, but basically a patient can sometimes come with this, if, especially if they're constantly licking that area, if they're constantly trying to get involved with that little area of the skin. Um, you can kind of see those little round crusts that are happening and forming with that extra redness. So when we think about the skin infections and our common pathogens involved with skin and soft tissue infections, in veterinary medicine, um, the predominant pathogen is Staphylococcus pseudointermediates. And this is basically um, a bacteria that is all over and is a normal skin flora for our canines. And so what happens is that over time that they can have that infection. What's more important too is that um, dogs can also get skin infections from a pathogen of Staphylococcus aureus. So um, Staph aureus is actually not the most predominant pathogen. It's not common um, in dogs compared to human for our skin flora. Um, when we usually see a Staph aureus infection, it's actually considered a zoonotic um, potential. And so the question for that is, are we getting the Staph aureus from our humans? Are the owners actually transmitting that Staph aureus to their patients? Um, so those are things to think about. Streptococcus is a big one. Pseudomonas is another one that we can commonly see with pyoderma. But I would say majority of the time that when I'm dealing with pyoderma, we're dealing with Staphylococcus pseudointermediates. And we treat that very similar like we would with Staph aureus in humans. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So when we talk about treatment, 
of pyoderma, I am going to focus on antimicrobial therapy um, and kind of what are our main options are out there in veterinary medicine and what you guys may be dispensing for our veterinary patients in your pharmacy. As far as our another common dermatological condition that we see in dogs is our, an autoimmune disease. Um, and this is pemphigus um, foliaceus. And what this is, this is the most common autoimmune disease that we see in dogs. Um, what basically happens when um, pemphigus is that there's autoantibodies that attack between the superficial epithelial cells that can cause blisters on the skin. And so what's important about this also is not only is it an autoimmune disease, but it can also be a drug-induced disease as well. We have penicillins, we have sulfas, um, amitraz-containing products, a lot of beta-lactams out there. Um, so those can actually cause an autoimmune reaction and can lead to the skin condition. Um, biggest thing with this, as long as you remove that drug, um, typically it can go away. You just have to treat the result of what's going on and it should be better. As far as pemphigus goes, um, genetics may actually play a role with certain breeds of dogs when it comes to this autoimmune disease. And the most common two that we see in the clinic for this particular disease is Akitas and Chow Chow. Um, but it's not limited to those two breeds. Um, we can also see it in Dachshunds and Shih Tzus. Um, those are also um, very common dogs that come into the clinic um, for this autoimmune condition. With pemphigus, though, there's no age or sex um, predilection in that regard. Um, so it's mostly just a breed genetic disorder. Um, but any animal at any age can get this. Um, it can be male or female. There's no preference from one versus the other. Um, but we do typically see this with our chow chows and our akitas the most. So what does it look like? What does pemphigus look like? And you can see in this picture right here um, that these blisters are typically um, starting in the face. Um, so you can see this pustules, these crusts, that erosion on the skin of this particular patient. Um, so what we see first is most commonly on the face area. So you can see the area around the eyes, around the nose, the ears. Those are probably where we'll see those signs and symptoms starting to present first. And as it progresses and this autoimmune condition progresses, we'll then see it in the feet area. So we can kind of see it around the toe pads, um, things like that. So you can see on the top of their pads, um, it could be in between those little pads that we have in our um, dogs. And then it can progress into the groin area. So when we see a very severe case of pemphigus, it's, it's all over. It's These babies are just hurting. They don't feel good. Um, and so um, for us, this is probably when we would see this. Um, other signs and symptoms for these patients, um, we can see in a lot of these cases that they may present with an appetence. They just don't want to eat. They're depressed. Um, sometimes they may present with a fever. Um, so these patients um, are really not feeling good when they come to see the dermatologist as a specialist. Um, this also is a condition that may present with other disease states. Um, and so this is something that may be like with Cushing's or hypothyroidism or something along um, some other chronic condition that we see. Um, so this is probably can be something in addition to, in addition to being a mono disease state for our patients. And again, the drug induced of beta lactams and sulfas. So how do we treat um, pemphigus? So what's interesting about this is that we need to minimize exposure to UV light. That is the key to this um, treatment protocol. And what happens is, is that UV light exposure can actually trigger inflammation that causes an autoimmune reaction. So preventing that, minimizing that exposure to that UV light is key. Our biggest goal with pemphigus is remission. Um, so we are going to go for that remission with chronic treatment. And this is typically a combination of steroids and immunosuppressants. Um, so our goal is that we're going to start with a corticosteroid, a systemic corticosteroid, and usually that's prednisone or pernizolone. That's our most common ones that we see. And the reason why we start with this is because it's fast acting. 
we're getting it going. And we're gonna start at two mix per keg for this patient, and we could be by mouth once a day. We can divide that dose if we need to, to every 12 hours at one mix per keg was easier for that owner. Um, we can actually kind of play around with that a little bit, but the main goal is a daily dose of two mix per keg. Once we get that patient stabilized and we get that working, um, over time, we're gonna taper that dose down to the lowest effective dose for our patients. Um, one, because we want to make sure that with this autoimmune disease that we're not causing this condition again, but two, we want to minimize the adverse effects of corticosteroids, which is very similar to what we see in humans with polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. Um, over time, it can also cause immunosuppression itself, so you can increase your risk for secondary infection. So we have to be very careful and make sure we're at our lowest effective dose. The other combination that we use, and sometimes corticosteroids is not used as a monotherapy, but we're gonna add on an immunosuppressant agent. And the most common one that we use in dermatology is gonna be cyclosporin, or in our world, an atopica is the brand name for cyclosporin in veterinary medicine. This is a modified cyclosporin, just for everyone to know. Um, we will start at a dose of five mix per keg for this patient. Um, by mouth once a day. And we're gonna see how they do, how they progress with this. If they are gonna be in remission and maintained, we can also lower this dose a little bit to help um, prevent immunosuppression long-term for these patients, because um, that's something our dermatologist wants to monitor. So for you guys, this is something that's really cool and interesting autoimmune um, disease for our patients. So let's talk about atopic dermatitis. This is probably the most common dermatological condition that we see in our patients. So what this is, is a genetically predisposed chronic inflammatory and pruritic um, skin disease that's from allergies. And it's characterized by an IgE mediated reaction. And this can be food allergies, environmental allergies. Um, it's actually very similar to humans um, with allergies and atopic dermatitis. The only difference between humans versus veterinary is that humans, as they get older, tend to outgrow certain allergies, um, while dogs do not. And what's worse in dogs, however, is that they can actually worsen over time if we don't manage this condition. Um, so for us, um, we're really worried about long-term of atopic dermatitis for these patients. So you can see in this picture that I have for you, um, this picture depicts the most common areas that are affected by atopic dermatitis. So when we look at this, the abdomen is probably the biggest one in the armpits of the dog. Um, you can see it around the eyes and the mouth and then in the legs area. Those are typically inflamed. You can see some alopecia. You can see all that's involved with these patients in these areas. And this is pretty typical. Like, um, it's very rare for us to not see it in these particular areas for atopic dermatitis. So who gets it? How often does this occur? Um, the prevalence of atopic dermatitis in dogs is about 10%. Um, we do have breeds that are typically um, kind of predisposed to this condition. One is our retrievers, um, we, like our Labrador retrievers, golden retrievers. Those are typically ones that can have an increased risk of atopic dermatitis. Our herding breeds, um, my favorite is a Sheltie, a Collie, Border Collie. Those are things that we think of when we talk about herding breeds. Bulldogs is also probably the top breed that we see where atopic dermatitis. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with Mississippi State, but our mascot is the bulldog. So we have a lot of bulldogs in our area that come see our dermatologist for certain conditions. Terriers are also um, big with this um, a disease state. Um, and I think when we say terriers, it can be an American Staffordshire Terrier. It can be um, basically all of those staffies, things that you see, um, mutts that are involved with those terrier mixes. Um, those are also increased risk of atopic dermatitis. Typically, the onset is anywhere from six months to three years. It can all, any go all the way up to six years as well. And so for these patients, um, we, can, we can see it when they're puppy, they're still growing. We, we learn that they end up having some type of allergy. 
Um, majority of dogs will exhibit non-seasonal allergies and non-seasonal atopic dermatitis. However, we do see a lot of flares and acute flares at certain times of the year, especially in the spring and the fall with certain weeds and certain flowers and trees growing um, and budding out from the winter. Um, what's really important too is that there's no sex um, predilections for this. Um, any male or female can have this um, condition and there's not one that's been more common over the other. When we see atopic dermatitis, again, the most common sign is going to be pruritus and then pyoderma. So that's why I really wanted to talk about those two first before going into atopic dermatitis, because those are, again, the two reasons why dermatologists are seeing patients is pruritus and then some type of skin infection as a result of some condition like allergies. So how do we diagnose um, atopic dermatitis. And this is actually diagnosed with an intradermal skin test. So I don't know if any humans um, on this call has ever had a, um, an allergy test before. Um, but what typically happens with our dermatologist is that she'll shave an area and we try not to shave too close to the skin. We don't want to accidentally nick it. Um, that can skew our results. Um, but we're going to shave that area down. And then what we're going to do is that we actually number and mark the areas. You can kind of see the little lines of the black dots um, on this particular patient. So what we do is that we're testing certain types of allergens um, that is going to be causing some type of IgE response. So we have a positive control, which is typically histamine, and then we have a negative control, which is typically saline for us. And what we do is that we're going to test all of these different allergens that are most common in the environment. Um, grasses is probably the big one, Bermuda grass, Johnston grass, all of those different types of grasses. What we do is that we test for every single one of them in order. Then we get into our trees. Um, sweet gum is an example, pine, um, loblolly is a big one. Um, I can probably name 5 million different trees that we deal with uh, for these allergens. Leaves, mites, and molds are also up there. Um, house dust is a big one. Um, and even uh, what always cracks me up when I put the skin test together for a dermatologist is even cat and human dander. So, you know, we always hear the hearsay that people can't have a dog or a cat because they're allergic to them. Well, the opposite can happen for us too. Like our dog can actually be allergic to us and our dog can actually be allergic to their housemate and if they have a cat. So it's actually um, always cracks me up when I see a dog test positive for human dander um, and say that they're actually allergic to their human um, and we're the ones that are taking care of them. So what happens is with that positive control and that negative control, we're going to test that reaction of that allergen on a scale and our dermatologist will figure out exactly what those causes are. Um, so, and then also in the meantime, what she will do is probably start a food trial and figure out what type of foods and things like that the dog may be allergic to as well. And this is a pretty cool procedure to see. Um, if I have pharmacy students that rotate with me at Mississippi State, um, and I know that there's a skin test coming up, I always say, hey, can my pharmacy students look, um, listen in and watch and kind of see how you guys do that? Because it's pretty neat to see the different types of reactions. So what I'm going to do is talk about the treatment of atopic dermatitis. This is probably the big gun of what we're wanting to do. And so there are three major categories of atopic dermatitis that we focus on treatment. And what's really nice that there's a guideline out there for us and it's free, it's available online, is through the International Committee on Allergic Diseases of Animals. Um, ICADA is how I always pronounce it, I-C-A-D-A. But what we do is if we focus on three major things. One, we're going to look at the treatment of the flare. What's causing this acute reaction to happen? What's causing this infection, causing this excessive itching in this patient? The second is the treatment of chronic canine. What that means is, is once we get that acute flare taken care of and settled, <clears throat> we got to focus on that chronic treatment for that patient. And then also, we're gonna implement strategies per, to prevent the recurrence of this flare from happening again. And we wanna make sure they're in remission. So when it comes to acute flares, we're gonna look at three major things. 
One, we're going to identify and avoid flare factors. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to also improve the skin and coat hygiene and care in their patients. And their other thing with um, acute flares is to reduce pruritus and skin lesions as well. So <clears throat> when we want to identify and avoid these flare factors, one, we're going to find that allergic cause. What is that from that skin test that we did? Sometimes owners don't want to pay the money for that skin test. So then the veterinarian also has to figure out what could be potential causes. Is it house dust? Is it pollens? Is it food? Is it the parasites that we keep talking about over and over again? So the main goal is to find that cause and then eliminate and remove the contact with that cause. So if it is a parasite, we want to eliminate that parasite. If it is a, a certain type of food ingredient, like chicken or something like that, we need to try a food trial and figure out what and get rid of that in particular chicken ingredient and see if that's the main cause. So what's important is identifying also infections. So bacterial and yeast infections are common causes of these flares. So we need to treat that infection. Usually we do this um, with a topical antimicrobial and we do this per antimicrobial stewardship guidelines. Um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about a little bit about pyoderma because this all comes into play together. Biggest thing to note <clears throat> is that topical antibiotics can be irritating or drying to the skin. <clears throat> and that can also cause even more problems in the future. So one, we want to make sure they have a good um, coat condition, treat that infection, but also make sure they're fine. So when I talk about the skin and coat hygiene and care, preventing that drying out of that skin, preventing <clears throat> future irritation, excuse me guys, we want to bathe with emollient formulations that contain either lipids, complex sugars, and antiseptics. This is probably the best for mild cases of the hygiene and care. Um, when we look at improving that skin condition, the intensity and the frequency of that is the important factor. How often are we having to bathe these animals? Is your dog a good bather? Is it easy? My dog hates the bath. I have to like slather the entire bathtub with peanut butter just to keep her in that bathtub while I'm in there. So we got to think about all of those different things. So examples of that are kind of two products. There's Duoxo, um, which is usually a chlorhexidine type of deal, Allermil, et cetera. So these are just some examples of shampoos and stuff that we can use to help with that skin and coat hygiene. The last thing that we want to do is that we want to reduce the inflammation and itchiness, the skin lesions that are involved. So what we'll start with this acute flare is a short-term treatment with either a topical glucocorticoid if there is a mild or localized type of um, reaction and the type of flare. So if it's a hot spot is what I like to say, this is great for a topical um, treatment option. And we'll do this with um, topical sprays. Um, Cordovance, Genesis are usually ones that we see the most common. Um, there are other ones out there, of course. If it is a little bit more severe, we're going to start a short course of oral or systemic glucocorticoids. Um, so for this one, we typically will go with prednisolone or prednisone. Um, we'll start this at 0.5 mix per keg by mouth, and we can do this every 12 to 24 hours. So that point, that's per dose. So we'll do 0.5 mix per keg per dose, um, twice a day or once a day. We'll also start um, some type of Apoquil. This is also really great for our patients. Um, we'll do this at a half mix per keg by mouth, twice a day for 14 days, and that usually helps with that inflammation, that um, itchiness, and things like that. So these are some really great options for our patients. <clears throat> for chronic treatment, um, once we get that flare kind of handled, um, we'll look into the chronic treatment of them. So we're gonna also look, again, it's all kind of the same theme. We're gonna identify and avoid flare factors. We're gonna improve the skin and coat hygiene and then reduce um, the pruritus and skin lesions. So when we identify and avoid these flare factors, not only are we doing what we talked about earlier, 
um, which is basically finding that allergenic cause, whether it was a food allergy, dust, pollen, the environment. Um, if it is a food allergy, we'll perform a dietary restriction trial in dogs. Um, and this is typically for those that kind of don't have a seasonal aspect to it. Um, and we'll do that dietary restriction for at least eight weeks exclusively on that diet. Um, and this gets really hard for owners to be compliant with. One, because I don't know about you guys, but my my dog every Sunday gets a waffle for breakfast. And so to tell my dog all of a sudden when we're making waffles on Waffle Sunday that she can no longer have a waffle um, is really hard for us to do. You get those big puppy eyes. Um, but it's really important that we can't um, introduce treats or table scraps or things like this with this restricted diet. They have to maintain plan. Um, the one good thing is that we do have hypoallergenic treats out there. Um, so with these restriction trials in dogs, we will give them that particular type of dog food for them to try and see if the dog likes it. And then we'll also give them treats. So they have some type of reward for certain things that if you normally do treats um, for your particular animals. We'll start a flea control regimen. So, and this is year round. Um, I don't know if anybody's from up north, um, but here down here in the south, um, it is hot as Hades right now. And we typically do year round um, flea and tick preventatives here. Um, they do recommend that oral preventatives is actually recommended over topical. And the reason why is because when we maintain that coat hygiene with that shampooing um, and bathing and things like that, we don't want that topical preventative to wash away. And so we're going to stick with an oral preventative for our patients in that regards, and we keep this year round. We're going to perform another, um, that test I was telling you about to identify those allergies. Those are typically when it's presented. And then we're going to implement house dust mite control measures for the owner. Um, so we're going to tell them, hey, like you, your dog might be allergic to your house. So let's try and clean a little bit. You might need to help um, vacuum a little bit more often than you normally would. Um, probably do a little bit more dusting than you probably have been in the past. So these are the things that are important to um, basically maintain and prevent that house dust from settling. We're also going to evaluate the antimicrobial therapy if they have a current infection. Um, so those are just some options that are out there from those guidelines. There's other things that we can use is terbinafine, itraconazole, and we typically um, use this for this particular type of dermatitis for our patients. So for the chronic treatment <clears throat> with the improvement of skin and coat hygiene, Again, we're not going, we're in addition to the acute flares with the chronic, we're going to do a once weekly bath. And we're going to do this with some type of non irritating shampoo. We're going to, our, the guideline says that we can supplement with oral sinchi fatty acids. Um, this is especially in rich in omega 6. Um, this, I will tell you guys, um, not everyone wants to use that supplementation. Um, but if they do, the biggest thing that we tell owners is that it does take months to see that benefit. Um, it's not a use as a monotherapy. This is also in addition to everything else that we're doing. Um, and basically with that germ food trial that we have, a lot of that diet is already enriched with essential fatty acids that help with that benefit. So if they don't want that oral supplementation, a lot of our germ products out there are big and especially rich in that omega-6. And if they want to, they can do topical um, essential fatty acids containing formulations in addition to oral if needed. However, I haven't really seen that being utilized um, as much um, for our patients. So the other biggest thing is that we want to reduce that um, itchiness, the skin lesions. So for chronic therapy, um, what we want to do is that if we have a hot spot that happens in the future, like a local area, we're going to treat that with a topical glucocorticoid or tacrolimus, um, usually as a hydrocortisone spray. We're going to treat with oral pharmacological immunomodulators. Um, this is going to typically be our glucocorticoids like prednisone and prednisolone. That cyclosporin I talked to you guys about with the autoimmune and then Apoquel. We're going to treat um, with biotherapeutic modulators if needed too. Um, I will tell you that I have not seen this as often in practice, the interferon gamma, but this is per the guidelines. So it's just an option out there for our owners if they want to utilize it. 
So this chart here for y'all is basically the most common things that we see um, in atopic dermatitis, um, dermatitis treatment. So with these immunomodulators, with a glucocorticoid prednisone, prednisolone, the dose is a half make for kick, and we do this every 12 to 24 hours. This is the fastest improvement of those clinical signs and maintaining those clinical signs. But once we get them to remission for chronic therapy, we're going to taper that dose to the lowest effective dose and frequency to minimize those adverse effects of GI upset, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. The cyclosporin modified atopica, we do a five mg per keg by mouth once a day. It does take a little bit of time to affect. We usually tell owners that you're not going to see anything between one and two months of improvement. So this is something, hey, we're going to add this on to, with the glucocorticoid because you have that fast improvement first, and then you will see the effects long term with the cyclosporin. Again, we're going to, once we get to that remission, we're going to taper to the lowest dose um, and frequency to maintain that and prevent adverse reactions. One is GI upset. We do have a lot of dogs that are very sensitive in the stomach. Um, so diarrhea, um, vomiting, things like that is typically what we want to avoid. And then we also need to worry about immunosuppression. Um, this is a hazardous drug. Um, so for our owners, um, we need to counsel them to wear gloves, wash hands. If they're someone who's pregnant or wanting to be pregnant, they should not be handling this medication. And then apple quail is another big one. Um, so this one's also about half a mg per keg by mouth twice a day. Um, we do this for 14 days, and then we um, switch over to every 24 hours for long-term treatment. Um, this is a JAK kinase inhibitor. And what it is, is that it's actually not FDA approved in patients that are less than a year old. So we can't use this in puppies. Um, we do taper this to the lowest dose that is effective for our patients, um, again, because of all the same reasons I talked about. And then the adverse effects are GI, lethargy, and UTIs with this uh, medication. And again, it is a hazardous drug, um, so we tell owners to wash their hands. Um, a lot of owners can get some type of derm reaction. It's irritating to them. The preventative strategies, um, one, we're going to avoid those flares, implement proactive topical pharmacotherapy, and then implement allergen-specific immunotherapy. So what does this mean? We want to avoid those, those factors, avoid the environmental factors, avoid those food allergens, maintain that diet after that food trial. It's really important to tell owners that after those eight weeks, if that food works very well for your dog, don't go off plan. Keep that plan in place. Keep those hypoallergenic treats out there. Don't give them table scraps anymore because we now identify that cause. Preventatives is the big one. Um, and then in the environment where you can't say you can't take your dog outside anymore. Of course, they need to have run around and lovely go outside, but maybe make sure when they come in, we wash them down um, and things like that after they go out. So other preventative strategies, um, we, would, we do provide um, some type of um, topical therapy to help. Um, with those previously affected areas. So we did talk about the hydrocortisone earlier. Um, they said that if you want to prevent a hot spot from happening, you do it two days um, a week, and that's two consecutive days a week. Um, it's not basically necessary. It's not something that you have to implement, but it's something if you want to help with that, you can. And then my favorite is the um, implementation of an allergen-specific immunotherapy. So we did that skin test. We figured out what allergens that that dog is allergic to, which is really cool. And what we do is that we can provide some type of therapy that's effective and a safe way to reduce this clinical signs. So we basically build up their tolerance to these allergens. And it can be oral, it could be some lingual or an injection. Um, so my pharmacy does the injection, um, but you can order this um, through certain companies. It does. The biggest thing with this product is that we tell a lot of owners is that we have to build up that immune response to those allergens. So it can take months. And when I say months, it takes months to see improvement in these patients. So in the meantime, while we're building up that immune tolerance, we're doing this glucocorticoid steroids. We're doing those so many different things to help maintain that. So next is antimicrobial therapy for pyoderma. So we have that skin infection and present with that infection. What can we do for treatment? 
Um, so when we talk about our options, the biggest one I like to talk about is generalized versus focal and localized. So when we look at generalized antibiotic options, we're looking at shampoos, sprays, conditioners. So antiseptics is what we're looking at, chlorhexidine, myconazole, benzoyl peroxide. We're going to typically use these topical antibiotics two to three times a week until seven days after those lesions resolve, and then we're going to do it once weekly for that prophylaxis. If they have a focal and localized um, skin infection, we're going to try a gel or a cream or an ointment. Um, basically get kind of nitty gritty into that area with some antiseptics. We're going to do hydroxyl acids, silver sulfadiazine, benzoyl peroxide, or antimicrobials. Typically that um, is going to be mupirocin that I've seen, the most common. Um, but we try to reserve that topical antimicrobial for targeted applications when those antiseptics failed. So we're going to try that silver sulfadiazine first, that benzoyl peroxide, and and then we may progress to the antimicrobial if it's not improving at that point. Biggest thing with our topical antibiotics with our owners is it's really hard sometimes to get them to be compliant. It requires a good amount of time and effort for our patients. So we really have to have them committed without missing this routine, missing that dose of that topical therapy. So compliance is probably our biggest hindrance for this. Patient is also our biggest um, a caveat with this. How stressed is that animal when it comes to topical? Are they going, is their temperament okay with you giving them topical therapy? Can you bathe them? Are you gonna slather your whole entire bathtub with peanut butter every single twice a week um, to get them to be compliant with it? So you have to think about the patient as well. But the biggest advantages of um, topical is rapid lesion resolution, is decreased antibiotic duration, and we do have minimal adverse effects because it's topical versus systemic. So these are things that we want to use of topical therapy before we go into a systemic therapy. When we can look at systemic antibiotics, the biggest thing is one, for owners, we're paying a lot of stuff out of pocket. Is the antibiotic available in a pharmacy versus a vet clinic? The cost of that antibiotic, some cost way more than others, especially if we get to resistance. Safety of that antibiotic. Um, it's not just the safety of the patient that we're thinking of, but the owner as well. Does the owner have a sulfa allergy? Are they um, allergic to any penicillins? Are, are they going to be reactive and, and safe handling those medications and ministering it to that animal? So those are just things that we have to think about. Resistance. We're, we're in a huge antimicrobial resistance um, phase right now, and so we have to worry about are we getting more high-tiered antibiotics? And then the patient. How hard are they to pill? We had this one bulldog, I swear you can do anything. He would pop that pill right back out of whatever treat you were hiding it in. So you gotta think about how easy is that animal to maintain that medication. So when we think about systemic antibiotic options, there's actually a wonderful guideline out there for antimicrobial treatment of superficial bacterial folliculitis. And so they kind of categorized it in three tiers. The first tier is their primary choice. This is their choice of therapy when it comes to systemic antibiotics. We can do this as empirical therapy or if um, the, the owner is um, electing to do a culture and sensitivity test. But the ones that I see the most common are clindamycins. We see a first generation cephalosporin like cephalexin. Um, we'll see amoxicillin clavulonic acid, whether it's Ocmitin as a human version or Clavamox as the veterinary. And then TMS is probably the big one. A lot of people know as Bactrim, I'll tell you, I, I know it as TMS nowadays. Um, but for our TMS one, we have to make sure that you have a local regional susceptibility um, to staph pseudoinemia. So that's where we might have to do a culture or if we're gonna do TMS as an option. And then again, owner safety of handling these medications as well. As far as second tier goes, this usually is when the first one is not appropriate. And this is where you will have to actually provide a culture and sensitivity report to look at that susceptibility of that antibiotic to that pathogen. This is where we'll go into third generation cephalosporins. Um, we might do doxycycline chloramphenicol, fluoroquinolones, and then rifampin. Um, so these are the ones that we think about. Chloramphenicol is probably the biggest one I can see on everyone's radar as being the most hazardous for human handling. Um, so these are things that, again, all depends on owner, patient, safety, and things like that when we look at second-tier drugs. 
And then third tier is probably our last resort. This is our last ditch effort to help with this um, skin infection. So it's when the first or second tier is not appropriate and then the cultures that indicate susceptibility is reserved for serious uh, methicillin resistant infection. And this is where we'll go into linezolid or vancomycin. I will tell you, I don't see a lot of vancomycin in veterinary medicine. It's usually reserved for hospitalized patients in an ICU setting. Um, linezolid is probably a little bit more common as a last dish effort for our patients. Um, but this is through a guideline for you guys that are out there. And this is typically what we use and go for for category with culture and sensitivity with our dermatologist. Biggest thing I always like to harp on is one, if I'm talking about antimicrobials, I have to talk about antimicrobial stewardship. Um, for us, it's basically looking at that optimal selection, that dose, the duration of that treatment that results in that best clinical outcome. The biggest difference between veterinary and human medicine is that in human medicine, we tend to do around seven days. Um, so it's a lot shorter course. And veterinary medicine, especially with pyoderma, is not uncommon for us to see three weeks of therapy, three weeks of antibiotic being prescribed. And then sometimes it's even longer um, because usually the veterinarian says to do it for up to seven days after the clinical signs have resolved. So that's probably the biggest difference between veterinary medicine and human medicine in that regard. But again, with antimicrobial stewardship, this is where pharmacists play a huge role because we are the bridge between human medicine and veterinary medicine. Human doctors can only treat humans, veterinarians can only do the non-humans, but pharmacists gets to be the whole provider. We get to do both humans and non-humans with our licenses. So us as antimicrobial stewardship holders, we can use this in all of our healthcare settings, in our pharmacies, in which antibiotics are prescribed for both humans and non-humans. So this is a really great option for our patients. So as far as summary, and I know I talked really fast to get through everything in my time frame, um, but these are so much dermatological conditions. You can see how complicated and overlapped it can be. All the different pharmacotherapy options that we have out there, everything's kind of interconnected when it comes to it. And our veterinarians are amazing in trying to figure out the diagnosis and figure out what to do with our patients. And pharmacists, we're a huge resource for antimicrobial stewardship for the treatment of dermatological diseases. We are there to help them, to help choose that regimen, help choose that dose, and figure out what can we do for our patients when we're really worried about resistance to these infections. So thank you guys for listening um, for the CE for the last hour. Um, if you need that, here's the evaluation link for that CE. Um, I thank you guys so much for your time and listening to this during your day. And what questions do you guys have for me? Thank you so much for this great session, Erica. We have a lot of questions that have um, come in. Okay, perfect. I figure there might be some. <laughs> Let me see if I can find them. See here. Okay. So the first question I have um, is going to be about the pemphigus. And it was said, how do you minimize exposure to UV light or all UV light? Um, basically, what we mean by UV light is um, you know, if you have an outdoor dog, make sure they have some shelter to um, provide shade if they're going to be outside. Um, basically, when I don't say UV light, as in keep all the lights off in your house, um, but basically if your dog's an indoor dog, we don't want to keep them outside all day, especially in the Mississippi sun out here in the south. Um, so we just want to make sure that maybe in the afternoon, early morning, rather than full daytime. Um, but usually these are for outdoor dogs um, that we want to make sure they have a shelter with that. And I think that helps with some other questions that I saw about UV light exposure. Um, shade is a huge one for our patients. Um, someone asked about allergy medications like Benadryl, Claritin, Zyrtec. Um, we do use those. Um, we typically stick to, like I work in a um, referring institution. So in my clinic, um, we kind of see the worst case scenarios, um, but we do prescribe diphenhydramine. We do prescribe um, all these medications, but it's typically those first generation antihistamines that we see the most being prescribed for our patients in that regard. Um, someone asked me if I preferred Apoquil over Cytopoint. Um, I will tell you, honestly, it's about 
money, it's about cost, it's about what we can do for our patients. Um, Apoquil is great, it's a little bit cheaper than Cytopoint. However, you're given it once a day. How easy is your dog to pill? Um, Cytopoint is a nice immunomodulator that's once a month, but you have to go and see the veterinarian to get that um, injected. Um, so you have the cost of the seeing the doctor um, once a month for that. So it's kind of a pros and cons. I don't prefer one over the other, but um, I was just doing it per the guidelines. So that's an awesome question. Um, another question was, let's see here. How expensive is the targeted allergy shots? Um, I will tell you it's definitely not cheap. Um, I can't speak of costs, but I would say somewhere around a hundred to three hundred dollars, depending on where you are, um, could be the cost of those allergy um, medications. Um, but I will tell you, when we prescribe it for our patients and dispense it, um, they're usually doing it every six months if they're getting a refill from us. But it depends on which ones that you use. Um, let's see here. Hopefully I'm answering these questions correctly for everyone. So this works out well. Um, someone says that, can we pill an animal by using a syringe and dissolving with water? You totally can do that. Um, you just have to be careful um, and making sure that that medication's integrity is not being effective if you are going to crush it and dissolve it in some in a syringe and give it um, in that presentation. Let's see here. Um, someone also asked, how often should you bathe an itchy dog? Um, I will say that it depends. It depends on your dog, how itchy they are, how bad those lesions are. Um, I've seen as often as three times a week or once a week. Um, it kind of depends and work with your veterinarian to figure out what's the best case scenario for those patients. Um, but usually if it is some type of licking in a certain area, that's typically a hot spot and we can use this with those um, shampoos and conditioners and things like that that we see. Oh, let's see. Um, someone asked for clarification of Cytopoint in um, comparison to other presented options. Yes, Cytopoint is a wonderful option for our patients with atopic dermatitis. Um, I, did, I didn't have time to mention that, one, because it's not in those guidelines that I provided to you guys for the ICADA, um, but it is a really awesome, we use it pretty much every day here in our clinic at our hospital. Um, it all depends, it's all patient preference, it's owner preference, it's cost. All of these are huge factors with derm um, conditions because the problem is, is that we, this is a chronic condition. This isn't going away. And so what's the affordability over years, months, things like that. And so our veterinarians are wonderful working with our clients to figure out what works best for those owners. Is it easier for them just once a month to come in for that side of point? Or is it easier for them to get a once daily medication at home because it's cheaper over time? It all depends on those patients. Um, age is a huge thing as well. And um, immunosuppression versus side of point, things like that. Let's see. Do I have time for a couple more questions? Yes. Yeah, we have we have a few more minutes. A few more minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Someone asked me an interesting one. If I've ever used low dose naltrexone for any of these disease states, and I would say actually I have not seen that. Um, I'm curious if you would read out to me um, individually in an email. I'm curious where you are, your question came from and see what that happens. But no, I have not seen that um, naltrexone used um, for any of these disease states in that regard. So I thought that was pretty cool. Cool question right there. Um, Let's see. As far as um, PKPD, what considerations do you take regarding pet patients, including renal dosing, et cetera? I have no experience with animals. Actually, this is a really great question because in humans, you know, as pharmacists, we're taught creatinine clearance. We're talking renal function all the time. And what's interesting in veterinary medicine is that we don't have renal dosing versus um, regular dosing. Um, what we tend to do is if we see 
this is where a pharmacist can play a huge role in. It's because historically veterinarians are not looking at renal dosing um, when it comes to our patients um, with kidney function and decreased kidney function. And so um, what we do, my pharmacist and I here at Mississippi State, is that we actually look at our patients and kind of see, hey, what, what drugs are affecting the renal system. Um, we do look at um, kidney values here at Mississippi State and see, hey, maybe we should dose a little bit less um, for these certain types of patients, but I will tell you, it's not part of their regular schooling of vet school to look at renal dosing of patients. So it's kind of an interesting thing that as pharmacists, we're a huge provider to helping with that um, regard. So I love that question. Let's see. We have, we have um, time for one more. One more, okay. Um, does sunscreen have a place in canines, like on the face or the nose? Um, we don't have like a specific type of sunscreen that we use. Um, however, sometimes um, if a patient is very, like when you see that like autoimmune condition with the nose and the eye area, um, we just have to be very cautious of it going into the eye and being ingested. But I have seen owners put on sunscreen to help with those certain types of areas. You just have to make sure that cleaning of that area is appropriate as well um, once you're done being outside or vice versa. So these are amazing questions. Thank you so much, Erica. This was such a great session. And everyone that submitted questions, we will um, submit those to our speaker, Erica. So if you didn't get your question answered live, we will follow up with an email. Um, I also wanted to give a reminder for anyone that needs continuing education credit, make sure that you do fill out that evaluation link. That link is found on the last slide of the presentation handout. You'll also receive an email one hour following today's live session that will include the evaluation link for the um, CE credit, a download for the slides, and then also a recording for the webinar today. Thank you very much and have a great uh, rest of your day.